choices, but I made a decision. And if you make the right decision about the success that you want to have, that decision will govern all of your choices. You'll never have to worry. There will never be any opportunity that comes around that sounds too good enough for the decision that you want to, that for the decision that you've already made. I can tell you that right now. There is nothing that can shake you, no matter what it is that you want to make happen for you. That night, I made that decision again. And I continue to make that decision, no matter what we were faced with, no matter what the obstacles were. So when you see me now, or if you saw me walking in school, I mean, it was not, not, not now, but then, nobody knew what was going on with me. In fact, I was embarrassed about it. And wouldn't you be? Think about it. Think about 13. 13, that's a tough age. Man, kids are mean at age 13. Mean at age 13. They don't care. They pick up on the littlest, smallest thing. They can find the most minute thing that you're insecure about, and they will exploit it. This was before internet. <laughs> Forget the Kardashians. This was before all of that, you know? So that wasn't in the internet, but they could pick out little things. I'm going to tell you how. I had two pair of Levi jeans. My mom bought me some, <laughs> got some Levi jeans, two pair. I had a red pair, the tag. Anybody older than you know I'm talking? There's a red pair with the red tag, and there's the kind with the orange tag. I had two. And all I did was rotate them in and out. And then this girl named Paula Young called me out one day, like, Norris, what jeans you wearing tomorrow? You wearing your red, red tag pair or your orange tag pair? Just dog me in front of everyone. Ah! You're 13. That's just mean. That's, but nobody knew my situation. In fact, while we were in that shelter, I, be, you know, I began to make friends. The thing with the shelter was we were only supposed to be there a week. That shelter was an old monastery. And it was creepy. It looked like a Scooby-Doo castle. When we first walked up, I'm like, whew. So we walk in, we go in there, and I mean, it's got the long, dark hallways. You could almost hear like the old monks like, oh. You could hear it like, is it you, Lord? <laughs> you know, just scary stuff. And so I'm, you know, we'd be in there and, you know, we began to function as a normal family. Well, we were only supposed to be there a week. This, this, this shelter was a place for battered women. So technically, we weren't supposed to be there because my mom wasn't a battered woman. We just were in a tough situation. We ended up getting to stay there for better part almost three weeks or, or more. Very fortunate to get to stay as long as we did. But while we were in that shelter, I started making friends at school, and so I had this group of kids, this pack of kids, that I used to, that I started walking home with. They were at least in that direction anyway. We walked through the projects. The school was on the other side of the projects. And so I didn't want anybody to know that I was at that, in that shelter. I didn't want anybody to know my situation. But my mom always kept telling me, listen, no matter what, you don't have to tell anybody your situation, but that doesn't mean you don't walk in, and you walk into that school with your head, with your head, head held high. Not prideful, just proud. Not beat down, but blessed. Don't let anybody know what you're going through. You can make it through this. So we'd be walking home from school, and then I got to a point, and we, one day, for some reason, we decided to make a turn going towards the shelter. I didn't want them to know. So I, so I quick said, hey, you know what, man? I forgot something back at school. I forgot a notebook. So I took off, and I ran around the corner, and I waited to see them kind of make it away from the block, and then I went around the other way. Next day, for some reason, they decided to go the same way. And I'm like, man, these, they, they cannot know that I'm staying in this shelter. So I went around the other way. This continued on for a couple of days. And then another day, I was walking across the street. And from where, from where, we, where I had to walk, you could see the Milwaukee Bucks arena. Now, that was, now the re relevance to that was, you know, in Alabama, we don't have any pro basketball teams. And we didn't have any pro sports teams back then. Still don't, you know? And that was back in 1982. So that was kind of a big deal that I could at least see the top of the arena. And like, man, that's where the Milwaukee Bucks play. Bob Lanier, Sidney Moncrief, them drug brothers can ball. They were the heroes back then. So I felt good about that. So I'm, I, we're leaving school, and I, t I decided I'm going to go back the other way because I didn't want anybody to know. And I'm kind of... I'm stepping across the street, gazing, stargazing, because I couldn't see no players, because it was a good piece, but it was down the hill. I'm kind of walking, and this car almost hit me. 
slammed on his brakes, and, I, and it startled me. But it kind of snapped me out of a gaze. And that's when I made the decision, another decision. I said, Lord, if, you, if, I, if I can just make it, if I can make it out of this situation, I will tell this story for the rest of my life. And that's why I'm here today, about one decision, one decision, one decision that governed all of my choices all the way to this moment right here and many other moments just like this, sharing this very story about the decision. That's the challenge. That's the challenge. You may not ever have to stand in front of a group of people and share your story, but you'll have it in here. And that's the thing that will drive you. It's the thing that will continue to make you want to get better. Never mind, at some point, you're going to find that special person that you want to spend your life with. There's lots of choices. <laughs> One decision. Lots of choices. There's a lot of females, right? I'm telling you, yeah, he's smiling. Yeah, yeah, bro, you are. <laughs> you get one decision, one. right? Lots of guys, right? Lots of choices. One guy. That's free. Make a decision. All you got to do is decide. Make a decision. And from there, it was, I wouldn't say it was easy, but from that point on, a lot of great things happened. A lot of good things happened to me that's not supposed to happen to somebody that's been in something like that before. Not supposed to. You're supposed to, you know what? You're supposed to go, well, you know, you're supposed to go and not make it. You're supposed, you, you didn't have a father. You, didn't, you, you guys didn't have any money. So how, do you, how did you succeed? How did you make it? You know, before I, before I graduated, by the time I graduated high school, I was in, at the time I was eighth grade, by the time I graduated high school, I was one of the top hurdlers in America. That's, aside from football, the real dream, I was one of the top high school hurdlers in America. I was a part of three state championship track and field teams. All conference, okay, all conference in football, all county, all of that, all of the accolades that come with being a star, I got to do that. I used to love it. It was cool. I had my letterman's jacket, and I'd get on the city bus, and the medals be clanging, clink, 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 clink. Nobody really knew the whole story, but you must go to South. That's where I went to high school, South Division. Oh, you must be from South. All along, still churning out, still looking, trying to reach it, trying to reach it, trying to reach it. Then I go to college. College was a whole nother bear. I ended up going to a small school, University of Wisconsin La Crosse. It was a Division III school. I played football and ran track there. I was an All American in track, an All American in football. And we won a national championship. And it was beautiful. And the cause of that, I got to sign that free agent contract with the New York Giants. Pretty cool. But all along, there was one thing that always bugged me. Always bugged me was not knowing my father. Ate me sometimes. Not all the time, but when I had my quiet moments, I would sit and I'd think about, okay, I know why I'm a certain way because I had my mother. But I don't understand what makes me angry or why am I have a temperament or why am I, why there's good things about me that I don't understand why they happen, but they do. And you always wonder. And I always, my thing was, I had always hoped to come off of the field, track whatever it was, and hopefully have my dad standing on the sidelines or standing in the tunnel waiting for me. All I wanted was a handshake. All I wanted was a pat on the back. You all right, kid? And I chased that. I chased it, and I chased it. But the good thing about chasing was that eventually I achieved it. Find your motivation of why you want to do it. It may not be the same as me, but here's the other thing. I loved the game of football. I loved it. I, I got a, a broken hand. I got two, two scars right here on my shoulders. Oh, I gave my body up for the game, for the love of the game. I did all of that because that's what I wanted. And it wasn't about the money. It never was that. In fact, I can just tell you right now, when I used to work out in the summer, 
And this is what really today is about. We want to send you off so that way you have the greatest off season that you've ever had. This is about to be your off season right now. During the summer, I was running stadium stairs one day and we have beautiful campus just like here. And we have the bluffs, they're not mountains, they're bluffs. And so I'm at the stadium and off from the stadium you can see the bluffs. And so I'm huffing and puffing, I'm going up the steps and I finally stop and I'm like, whew. Lord, I just want to taste the NFL. Can you let me taste it? I just want to taste it. I didn't ask for no money. I said, can you let me just taste it? I just wanted to taste it. So he let me taste it. How many people remember me? Y'all remember me from the league? How many older people? Y'all remember me? New York Giants? Oh. oh, come on now. What? I'm talking, shoot, man. I was in the league one, seven months. What y'all talking about? Y'all tripping. Y'all better Google me. Don't Google me. There is another Norris Thomas who's since deceased, and that's not me. Seven months. That's all it was. And then I went up in Canada and played for a couple of years in Canada, and the career was over. It was done. So now what? And on top of it all, I had never found my dad. Before we get into this last piece, I will share this with you. I did eventually find my father at the age of 34 years old. Don't ask me how old I am now, and I'm not going to give you the year that I found him. <laughs> but at the age of 34, I found my dad. The same weekend of Father's Day. Isn't that crazy? That's just crazy. The same weekend of Father's Day, I found my dad. Now, all of this time, and I'll just tell you, you know, back in the day, there was no internet. There was the white pages. And then there was zero, and then you dialed the area code, and then you go. Now, I tried all of that, all of those years. Even when I was a New York Giant, I finally signed my contract. I'm out in New York for the summer of 93. Yeah, now I just told you. I was out there in the summer of 93 as a rookie free agent. And I used to sit in my hotel room when we were in between workouts, and I would sit there and I'd be shaking like I'm doing something totally forbidden. I should not be looking for my dad. I should be honoring my mama for raising me to be the man I am and thinking about trying to make the team and all I'm sitting there and in the phone book there's thousands of H Browns. I'm like, whoo, so I just started dialing them. Uh, <laughs> and I was waiting for somebody to cuss me out. I was sure enough waiting. Everybody was so nice and kind. No, nobody by that name. And I'm like giving my sales pitch. It was my first sales job. My first ever sales job, just dial, 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 dial. And it, nope, that's not, okay, thank you. So I move, and it finally got to a point to where, you know, oh, man, I, I was exhausted. My roommate, uh, Tico Duckett was my roommate. He had played running back at Michigan State. Tico's, Tico had a dad. In fact, his dad came and visited one weekend and I just kicked it with him like I was his kid. And he's sitting there giving me advice and everything. I'm just rolling with Tico's dad. And Tico looking at me like, man, how many questions are you going to ask this brother? <laughs> you know, I, just was, I just wanted to know some stuff. And he was forthright in telling me and sharing information with me. Okay? But I just, I, enjoy, I enjoyed that time. But I sat there and I was so afraid. But here we are, you know, a few years later, and I find out, you know, the internet comes about in about, what, 2000, roughly, somewhere in there. It starts with gaining ground, but I didn't really know how to use it. And it's 2003, and the, two, the next Olympics, 2004, was already in. Now, I'm some years removed from competition as a football player, but I remember I was a hurdler. I decided I'm going to still, 34 years old, I'm going to keep chasing this man. So I decided I'm going to train for the Olympics. So I start, I'd moved from, at this point, moved from Minnesota. Now I'm in Arizona, where I live now. And I'm like, man, I think this is what I'm going to do. Because I still, in my head, from how many years ago, thought if I got on TV and made it famous, and I, and I majored in broadcast. I work in the media. Yeah, that brother's still not seen me on TV yet. I thought if I got on, you know, so I'm out there, I'm hurling one night, and, this, and I got to a point, I was, I had already, at 34 years old, I had already hit the B standard for qualifying for the Olympic team for 2004, for 2004 Olympics. So I was a year away training, in probably the greatest shape of my life. And when I tell you, when I'm telling you about, when we get in here in a little bit, about focus, and when you really are getting after it, 
I was at the strongest point in my life at 34 years old. I was squatting 600 pounds for six reps. I could bench press 405 for three. I could deadlift three times. One, two, three. 525 pounds pulling off the ground at that age. I was the fastest that I had, I was faster then than I was even in college, even as a professional football player. You talk about locked in. You talk about one decision. I was still chasing my dad. I just want, I needed to know. And somebody called me, I'm gonna have to track, and this lady called me from my old church back in Minnesota. Just called to see how things were going in, in Arizona. And I says, hey, how you doing? I'm out of breath. She's like, what are you doing? I says, well, I decided I'm gonna train for the Olympics. And most people only knew me as a football player after I retired. And she says, you're doing what? I says, well, you know, I met this old guy who's a hurdle guru, and he basically said he's trained Olympic hurdlers before, and I'm better than all of them. So I was on my way. This is where we, we were headed. Except I didn't know how to lose weight. I was, I was running hurdles, and I was built like a football player. I was 195 pounds and about 6% body fat. Just, boy, what? Boom. So I'm coming off the hurdles. Boom. Just powerful. Just big. Most hurdlers aren't that big. Some of them, Roger Kingdom, but most of these guys aren't big guys. So I couldn't get down to that like, college weight where I was, like eight, 188. If I could have lost about seven pounds, maybe. We don't know. So anyway, I'm telling her, I'm huffing and puffing. She says, you're doing what? I'm like, yeah, I'm trying. And I said, she says, why? And I'm like, I said, you know, I never knew my father. You know, I just always, I said, <laughs> going into my sales pitch, I never knew my dad, blah, blah. She says, well, what's his name? And I says, well, his name is Hurley Brown. And she says, what? And says, well, where is he? I says, well, I don't know. My mom always said he was from North Carolina. So she says, well, hold on a minute. So she hung up the phone. I'll call you back. She hangs up the phone, calls me back. This is a Thursday night. She calls me back and says, oh, well, here he is right here. I said, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right here on, you know. I said, well, what's the number? She says, well, here, hold on. I said, you got anything? To my witness, I found a piece of, like, gravel and wrote this phone number down. Because I, I didn't know how to use my phone then. This was back when, when text was just, come. so I didn't even know how to take notes on my phone or anything. I found there was a pencil, because I was at a high school, there was a little pencil stuck in the gravel, and I <laughs> chewed off the end of the pencil and found a piece of paper in the garbage and wrote the number down. So that night, I'm like, so is this really him? This can't be this brother. Man, you got to be kidding me. I mean, you really, and I'm telling, I said, you realize how many phone calls I have made to the operator trying